Hello, and welcome to NAB Talk. NAB Talk is proudly brought to you by the NAB Wealth Financial Group, helping you reach your destination in life on purpose. My name is Simon Prowse, and I'll be your regular host for this series of podcasts. And I look forward to bringing you interviews and content on a broad range of topics. Topics that will be educational, inspirational, informative, and at times fun. Today's NAB talk is quite an interesting one. I'm talking to Carl McLaughlin. Carl is a recently retired and successful owner of a small business, in this case a coffee shop. Whilst the discussion with Carl is around the the metrics of of him running his coffee shop, there's some real key takeouts from Carl's talk that can be applied to literally any small business. And the fundamentals, if you like, of establishing and, and, and operating a small business that really resonate from Carl's talk. The idea of a niche or a, or a gap in the market can create instant goodwill or clients with limited competition. And if you look at any business, the immediate success of picking a niche or, or, or a gap in the market cannot be overlooked. I hope you enjoy the talk today with Carl. And if you are thinking about starting a business, taking out some of those key messages Carl's got that could be applied to any style of business, I hope that you enjoy my discussion today with Carl McLaughlin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's podcast. Today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing Carl McLaughlin. Carl is a successful business owner, and in particular, a coffee shop owner. Thanks for coming along today, Carl, and welcome. Thanks for uh, having me on. So, Carl, you you had a coffee shop for a number of years and you're now retired. Tell me, uh, how's retirement treating you? Time is treating me very well. Um, It was 14 long years of hard work and um, the opportunity that came up to retire and uh, enjoy the fruits of my past labour. Oh, that's great. Now, uh, before we get into the coffee shop itself, Carl, why don't you give us a little bit of your backstory and how um, and your journey, if you like, as to how you got into uh, owning a coffee shop? Sure. Well, um, grew up on the northern beaches here, and um, to start off with, I was at high school, and then started working in um, my father's restaurant. Went to Ride Catering College for three years, did a, a degree there, and moved on through hospitality, working in international hotels. Uh, restaurants, clubs, uh, resorts in the Witch Sundays. Travelled overseas, all through Europe and uh, England and uh, worked in hospitality over there, the usual pub and um, restaurant scene uh, before returning to Australia, back into hospitality, clubs uh, and so forth. Take me back to Ride and you said you got a degree. What what was uh, the specialty or what was that degree at the uh, time? It was just a general hospitality and catering degree to, just to give you a, a full background from kitchen to front office and of how everything worked. And in that degree, did you learn to cook and, and, and do the back, well, the back of house, so to speak? Yeah, learn to cook, um, ordering um, and front of house, um, just all that more t- geared towards the international hotel kind of trade because I went from there and um, did an apprenticeship with a Southern Hospitality Group who owned the travel lodges and all those sort of things. So I was there with them for about three years as well. And is that where you started to do your travels? Was that with them? or is No, that- no, I didn't start to do my travels with them. It was after I left them that I started uh, travelling. Okay, and and you've you've done that for about sort of twenty years, and then you start probably, to think, well, I'm going to own my own business. Um, probably longer than that. It was probably more like thirty years. I was in and out, travelling, uh, and just moving around. Before I decided, okay, I'm tired of working for somebody else. I wanted to be my own boss, have my own business, and um, find my own way. And what what was that? the catalyst of that decision, if you like, do you think? What what sparked you to say, well, I'm going to own my own business? Um, just looking at where I've worked and the experience I've got and thinking I could do it better um, with a few different ideas and, um, yeah, really make it so hopefully in the end I had a solid business where I could get to retirement. 
So you, your thoughts around having your own business was you, you saw others out there and what the things they got right and wrong and you you'd sort of worked on that over the years and believed you could do it better. Um, and, and did the, the thought of owning it yourself, would that, was that something that really excited you or is that something that you, you made you more nervous, I suppose? Um, probably a little bit of both. Uh, excited and a bit nervous. But initially it was either open a small bar or... Open, open a coffee business, a, a cafe. So it was just a matter of tossing out which would fit in better with the lifestyle I wanted. Okay, and what made you decide on the coffee shop in the end? I could see an opportunity there and, and spoke to a few people and back then that was about 16 years ago and coffee was still in its infancy in Australia. Um so yeah, there was a definite opportunity to, to get into the into the coffee business, cafe, if you like. So the market was one of those ones that was just sort of starting to grow and really get some legs and you it thought It was yeah, it was pretty tiny and and the standard all the big boys are out there, but there was no there were a couple of niche ones that were just starting off. Um, so yeah, so really saw an opportunity to, to get into that market. Would you say that was one of the key ingredients for success is identifying the, the hole in the market and the fact that you could plug that hole with what your idea was? Yeah, it's, it's identifying that hole um, and then mainly coming up with a point of difference because you don't want to be like all the large major coffee businesses. You want a, a unique brand that, uh, that, that gets you customers in. That's that's an interesting topic in itself, and we might dive down that hole a little bit if you don't mind. And you mentioned the the, the niche or the key ingredients. Do you want to sort of take us for a bit of a journey there and what that looked and felt like at the time for you? So back at the time, there were a couple of hole in the wall type places in Darlinghurst um, and a couple of places there roasting their own coffee, and nobody on the northern beaches really, um, and was. I was just looking for a, an opportunity at the time to have something local where I didn't have to travel, have a, a niche market and and have a genuine passion for, for what product I was producing that I was going to be putting out there to the customers. And, and that's your brand, if you like, yeah? Yeah, that's, that's my brand. Um, and then there was, there was a like research, travel, learning how to race, learning the whole... Um, journey through through coffee where it grow where it's grown and the whole process to, to getting it into the cup and and during that process you're obviously working on your own blend or formula if you like of coffee because it's actually quite difficult is it not yeah it's very difficult um, I've got a lot of research into the, the different types of beans and their different characteristics so where they where different beans come from whether it's South America or Indonesia or Africa wherever, they've all got their own characteristics and trying to come up with a blend that's uh, consistent um, and that everybody likes is, uh, yeah, it was a bit of trial and error. And, and once you think you've got that blend, how do you know if everyone likes it? <laughs> well, I, it was the, the blend I ended up, I tried a couple of blends to start off with, which is one and two, and then I settled on the third one I, I came up with, which was... A little bit more by mistake, but in the end it really worked. And then after a year or two, I thought, okay, I'm getting a little bit bored with this. I'll, I'll change it. And I went to a fourth blend and the customer base that I built up and that was really loyal said, what have you done? And we, we don't like it. So I had to go back to the third blend, which is the one I stuck with for 14 years. And that no. became the, uh, the brand, if you like, Carlos. And that yes. was one of your signatures, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was, yeah, it was, I just named it Classic 03 because it was the third blend I came up with. Oh, very good. And and that blend, if you like, and, and that surety around the taste is, is pretty key to, to making oh, that work I, I, for a coffee shop? Absolutely, because as you know, there are like um, the big chains and whatever that are around and they rely on consistency. So you walk in, you get the same burger you get the same chicken you get the same coffee people want consistency um, that's that's a main ingredient 
So I, I want to dive into um, that consistency and the simplicity of your approach because I think that was a unique characteristic you had. Um, before we go down that, um, talk to me about this hole in the wall concept and why you thought it might work. You said you mentioned you mentioned you saw one in Darlinghurst and and they had a, a, a their own blend and were yep. serving over hole in the wall. What what did that? What was that for you? That so the, the the hole in the wall idea was. One, it was going to be cheap to set up. Um, and two, um, you didn't need much equipment. Uh, and three, it was quite crucially at the time, didn't need staff. So for the first six months, it was just me. So yeah, well, that, that it has its good and its bad, I dare say. It, uh, it, it, it does. Um, but it was just a real, it was a real trial and I didn't know if it was going to work. Um, because in those first six months, not only was I open seven days a week working working mornings, I did I was still doing three nights a week at a club doing bar, just to just in case it all fell on the floor, and I, I had to have some income coming in. So really, you you made sure you had income while you're setting the business up, and, yeah. and you had an assurity or a stopgap yeah. to pay the rent and to keep life in keep, balance. Pay the rent, keep life in balance without making a major investment because kitchen equipment and everything else is very expensive. Okay, so we've, we've got the hole in the wall, which means we're in more a takeaway style environment. Um, and, and would you, looking back at that, say that was one of the, the magic um, touches to what you came up with because people didn't um, sit down and, and converse? Yeah, the, the, the idea was to make it just take away, take your coffee and go because there was li limited parking uh, out the front of the shop and mainly you, you were, we were looking at that morning trade where people are on their way to work, they want to grab a coffee, they're not coming in to sit down, um, jump on the internet, have a coffee and a glass of water and stay there for an hour or so. So the fast food takeaway style concept was the one that you saw as yeah, the key. Yeah. And that was the niche you targeted, of course. Yeah. And at the time, I, I didn't have the space in the shop to be able to do a sit down. There was no real kitchen or anything like that. So it forced your niche in a way as well. Yeah, slightly. Okay. So your environment sort of it created the, the shop that you did and you obviously looked at it. In, in other areas and you saw it was working and and then your consistency of formula that meant people wanted to come back so you had more volumes every day so you you start with a hole in the wall and and a couple of clientele and you're building up um what sort of volume you're doing in in the business um and remembering it was just me uh, on my own in those first six months so i was probably doing 20 kilos a week and then Progressively, it just multiplied from there um, because um, I was roasting my own coffee in the shop. I had a little uh, roaster as well. So not only am I selling cups, but I, at that stage, there were, there were a few people um, with their own little coffee machines. So I was actually selling roasted beans as well. So I had a couple of products going at the time. And building your brand. And building the brand. So yeah. And did you have any other coffee shops actually buying your brand? Uh, I had a couple, but... Nobody really, they all looked at what can I get? Uh, because the big boy, the big brands, yeah. they, they give, they sell it down. Like we're going to give you everything, the machine, umbrellas, the cups, and I, but I can go into the pitfalls of all that uh, later. Okay. So you're building up your clientele. You, you're starting to move a fair bit of product and you, I dare say you've got the regular clientele. Is there any key to managing those people and expectations and any, anything to take away for those people out there that want to start um, their own? Really engaging people and, and maybe I wasn't the best of, at that at the start, but yeah, an effort to, to say hello, how's it going? How's your day going? And you would say that over and over again like it's repetitive because someone's coming in and out all the time there, there are different customers um, and then just getting to know what they liked and ha how they like their coffee uh, and, and so on from there and then and then the same flow down into the staff i got who were really good as well who, who would engage people while they're making coffee and then have a talk to them because 
the hole in the wall thing gave you that opportunity to a little bit like a bar you're talking over the over the counter and and, and engaging the the customer rather than come in order your coffee and then the barista's out the back making a coffee and yeah, giving it to you yeah okay and and did that come down to even preempting the, the coffee orders at times is it sort of making oh, it as I, fast I, as possible a, a lot of the speed was besides uh, continuity uh, of, of, of the product speed was was another key element because in the mornings everybody's in, in a hurry to get to work so I, I, and I've got to say that the, the staff I had working for me over that period they were right on it they'd see somebody drive by and if they couldn't get a park the people would go around the block and by the time they got back coffee's made ready to go and if they didn't have time to pay for it they say oh well I'll get you the next day so it's that trust and 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 that um, I guess just awareness of, of what people want and and when people say like you're buying a business with goodwill well that's the goodwill that you've got to build up yeah yeah now you you've got the hole in the wall you're making the coffee you're churning them out and you start to branch into something a little bit more like a sandwich or or, or, or something yeah, takeaway. how did that develop the, the sandwiches was was always there and i only ever did ham and cheese tasties or cheese tasties and kept it really simple i didn't in those initial 10 years there was never any idea to start making breakfast and so forth so do ham cheese tasties and then go into bacon egg rolls but everything was pretty quick pretty fast um and yeah it, it never got to the real sit down stage it was always like here's your coffee here's your bacon egg roll and keep it really simple yeah, so you're, you're limiting the what the customer is ordering, which is limiting your downtime in order to turning it around, and you're keeping it really consistent. So that simple approach was another, another key ingredient? Yeah, oh, 100% key, key ingredient into keeping, keeping people coming back. And, um, yeah, that's all, all they wanted at, at the time. So over these years and, and part of your learning and your journey, you, you've seen the key, key ingredients to success and you've, you've, you've tried to emanate them or, or take them on board and utilise them, which sounds you did very well. Tell us a couple of the ultimate failures, if you like, or, or, or any, have you got any stories around the what nots to do or what you learnt along the way that you were never going to go down the road? I guess in the end I've learnt because we, we changed in the end. Uh, and if we'd kept the same formula, it would have it would have still it would have been more successful without the stress and headache. So, what did you change that you that you're referring to there? Well, we we ended up buying the building, which is something small, uh, redeveloping it, trying to turn it into that cafe sit down operation, and it never really worked. It, I guess my heart wasn't that much into it because it, it had changed so much from the quirky um, little hole in the wall that we had to trying to be what everyone else is and I wasn't I didn't want to be what everyone else was so you were, you were and you put your, you I think you've nailed that you, you were trying to get into a market that that was already quite saturated or busy rather than maintaining your niche that wasn't busy so yeah. therefore you you're being one of the crowd yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, lots of people in the same suburb here. They like, tried to emulate me, but it never quite kicked off. They they came and went because they couldn't compete with one the product and two the the, the service I was I was giving. So, Carl, we we start our own business. We start working on our own, and we don't have staff. Tell me a bit about the commitment to the business and the hours of uh, work that you're doing at the time. So. Brand new business, brand new idea. Not only am I making coffee, but I'm roasting my own coffee. So I um, had to get help sourcing beans, learn how to do it. And as I stated previously, that first six months, um, yeah, I was working seven days a week, still working at night at a club. But in that first year, the commitment was open every day for 365 days a year. And... Um, find out what days work, what days don't work, to, to the end where I kept a day-to-day a -day diary of um, what the income was, like what the sales were, 
but also whether the, there was factors of weather, whether it was pouring with rain, whether it was 40 degrees outside, um, whether there was some event on, because um, all those things impact your, your business. And I did that every year. I, I kept that diary, if you will, just to, to give me an idea how it was going year to year and what factors might change. That's really interesting. And tell me, you, you must have drunk a bit of coffee yourself at the time. <laughs> I drank a lot of coffee at, at, at the time and, and, t and did try different blends and did try different single origins, but yeah, it still came, came back to the, the, the same one. But what I realised in that first year was that the, I don't know, the dream of owning a cafe coffee shop, is the harsh reality is it's hard work and it's not, um, and unless you're working in the, doing in the city, in the CBD where it's just Monday to Friday, it's like a 360 day year job. Yeah, and yeah, so a big can, commitment. Yeah, a, a big commitment and you can have a manager in but in the end, you need to be pretty hands-on for, for it to be successful so you know what's going on. Yeah, and this is a smaller type operation with not a hell of a lot of scale and you're going for fast niche, knowing your customer, so it really suited the hands-on approach. Yeah, and this, the idea of being small and only having limited staff, whereas like two, two and a half, three staff, was fine, but if one of those went down sick or whatever, well, it was me that had to jump in and, and, and cover. So, yeah, okay. Yeah, so the, and that's why I looked at the big cafes and stuff where you start to get 10, 12 or more staff. You know, the, the staffing issue is, is pretty tough. People again, right? People. That's coming up in multiple conversations. Now, there's one more area, being an accountant, I've got to cover, and it's managing your, your inflows and outflows, all the books. Um, you probably didn't learn this when you were back, you know, doing the ride school and, and learning no. how to cook. No, no, it was it was a matter of uh, learning on, on the run and uh, and asking and keeping records. And when I ended up retiring and I, I did sell the business, the person I sold the business to, I said, one of the key ingredients is you've got to keep on top of your paperwork, you've got to keep on top of your invoices, what's in and out, because otherwise you'll get swamped in the end and, and you just won't be able to cope. Talk to me a little bit more about the, the getting swamped. Did you find that that was your weekend of uh, watching the football and, and doing your paperwork or how did, how did that yeah, work Yeah, it, it started off, well, you, you know, you keep it in the pile and you think I'll do it once a week and then it builds up and then okay, there's something comes up, so you want a break, so you, you leave it. And then that, even though it's only a small business, it just it piles up on you and then you end up having to spend hours and hours at it. Whereas if you kept up on a day-to-day -day or uh, whatever scale, you'll, you'll make life for yourself a lot easier and you won't make mistakes and you won't miss payments or invoicing people for things. I, I, I want to just make sure with the public out there that everyone knows that, that Carl's a bit old school and he was running his business before there were wonderful softwares that there are now um, helping with this process, but it certainly is still a process in itself, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's still a process. Um, and I know, I know you'll, like I was saying with that diary, I mean, you can you can see the figures, but, but the effects of whether the weather or whether you were down a staff member or... What, what, with, whether it's COVID, um, you know, it, that doesn't reflect in figures. You've, you've got to keep a record of that and, and that, that helps you track further trends down, further on down. Yeah, so that, that's a really a key one for me. You, whilst your, your figures of seasonality and days in the week, but you, you, if you don't sort of keep a, a feel for, okay, the weather was warm and, and, and really conducive to people being out and about, um, it's going to give you a false reading. Yeah, yeah. And you might think, oh, well, I've had a really bad week this week or I've had a really good week this week. You can look back on your records and what you've done the previous go, oh, well, really, over the short period, it's probably not that much different. And then you can see if there is a downward trend, okay, well, there's something I'll need to address and I'll need to investigate it further. So a few, a few financial KPIs and non-financial and joining them together to give you a real good feel for that, yeah, to, that flow. Yeah, to, to give you an overall picture and, and flow of how the business is going. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Actually, really important because, you know, I, 
as an accountant, I look at businesses and we look at the, the sales for the day, but we don't ask why the sales for the day could have been different. And, yeah, and that's a I, real critical one. And with, with me being the, the first one here, and then as I said, there were a few others opened up. So, okay, initially I lost a few people there because everybody likes to go to a new business in the because it's a little kind of village here. So that affects you again. So you, you hope that goodwill and loyalty you built up, okay, they've tried down there, but they're coming back because the, the service and the, and the, the uh, product that they're getting here is superior. And that was the outcome you found a lot of the time? Yeah, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I never really had any down, downside to it. Yeah, that's great. So, Carl, in summing up, and, and this has been fantastic for, for my knowledge and also all those people out there who are thinking about having a crack and, and getting into hospitality, not that COVID would have put anyone off at all. Um, the, the keys for me, um, find a niche, keep it simple. Um, you mentioned speed and continuity in your in your. Um, discussion um, continuity being the blend and speed just getting it out there because people are short with time and they just want to move it but the hard work factor just can't be ignored and can't be ignored and, and, and that's what I said whether it's whether you think of opening, opening a small bar or any of those things you've got to put in the hard work and you and it doesn't stop like when you go away on holidays it doesn't stop if the shops open it doesn't stop I mean, the, the good news is, people out there, I'm, I'm talking to a man who's retired and quite comfortably so. Um, yes, he's reflected on the hard work. But, Carl, the hard work paid off? Yeah, 100%. The hard work paid off and, and, I, and I'm enjoying it now. I can, I can relax and I don't have to do those 365 days a year. and I don't have to work on Christmas Day every year. And tell me, is the local coffee shop getting your blend right and supplying the coffee you like? Um, I still roast my own coffee at home, so I'm, I've, over those years I've got pretty fussy, so even when, when I go away on holidays, I, I take my own coffee with me. Oh, really? I'm, I'm going to have to try your blend, Carl. Okay. Uh, that's, that's great. All right, well, I really appreciate your time, Carl, and um, I'll leave you going back to retirement and, and playing a bit of golf. Beautiful. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today for NAB Talk. You can listen to other podcasts in the NAB Talk series via YouTube or where you get your favourite podcasts or simply search NAB Talk. Be sure to follow NAB Wealth on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter. And please, if there are any particular topics you would like us to cover for a future episode, let us know via our website. I'm Simon Prowse. Until we talk again.